When I found out I was pregnant with Penelope, I was scared. I just, I don't know what I'm gonna do if it's positive. I don't know. I had a four month old baby who was already missing milestones. We had just found out that three of our kids had a chromosomal abnormality that was most likely hereditary. Having another baby was not in the plans. <laughs> but there it was, I was holding it a positive pregnancy test and suddenly we became the landing crew family of eight. I was scared to be a mom to six. I was scared of the laundry, <laughs> but I was so scared that I could be having another child that could carry the same abnormality. But underneath that fear was hope and love. I'll never forget the day that we found out that we were going to be having a baby girl after having four boys. Oh my God! Stephanie! Oh my God! Oh my God. Are, are, are you sure? Oh my God! That day will probably go down as one of the happiest days of my life. Pregnancy was long and hard, but the moment I saw her, it made every pain and every every sleepless night 100% worth it. I had hopes and I had dreams and I had ideas in my head what this little girl was gonna grow up to do and be and I mean, don't we all? That's what we do when we have a child, right? I always say that she was the gift I never knew I needed, but it's so true because she has brought so much happiness and so much love to our family. For the first eight months of her life, Penelope met every milestone and not just developmental milestones, but social milestones. We would get the question a lot on our monthly updates if I was worried about her having autism. Am I seeing any red flags? None whatsoever. I'm not concerned about anything with her. I was being 100% genuine when I said I was not concerned. She's socially small. She tracked things and people. She was aware of her surroundings. At eight months old, she would respond to her name half the time. She loved being cuddled. She she loved seeing Lonnie and I, and if we walked away from her, she would get upset. She had all the signs of a typical child. Around six to seven months old, we started to introduce baby food to her. Um, her reaction was like the gagging, the tongue thrusting, and we just figured she wasn't ready. Every one of my children kind of ate baby food at a different like time in their life. So we really didn't push the issue and just kind of waited to see when she would be ready for it. She started to look like she was gonna start crawling, like rocking around eight months old, but she didn't actually like master crawling until closer to almost 10 months old. But we really didn't think anything of it because one, she, she just couldn't get the positioning like of her legs and adjusting her legs correctly. And also guys like for real, her, her thighs was and are very, very, very chunky. So I kind of figured it would take her a little bit to crawl. But shortly after she started crawling, so she's about 10 months now, we realized that she was still having the weird reaction to food. Like her whole body would kind of like shudder and shake and she was still having the gagging thing. And I remember asking my best friend, Melissa, I was like, hey, like, is this normal? She just basically told me to just keep trying with her, uh, try not to borrow, worry about it, and then talk to her pediatrician at her 12 month appointment. She was getting all of her nutrition on formula. So it wasn't like she wasn't getting what she needed. I mean, obviously she was at a very, very healthy weight. So that was not a concern. During Thanksgiving, all of our family tried feeding her. They tried feeding her like there's just the basic foods that most babies would eat like mashed potatoes, soft veggies. My mom tried feeding her pie. They tried spoon feeding, finger feeding, trying to get her to feed herself. Nothing was really working. I just figured she just needed a little bit more time to get accustomed to food. As a lot of people told me, hey, like my kid didn't start eating till after their first birthday. So I was like, okay, we'll just wait and see and see how it goes. Also around this period, so about 10, 11 months old, I did realize that she was starting to do like a hand wrist stem thing, but it really didn't concern concern me. She was saying mama, she was clapping, she was aware of her surroundings, she still seemed very attached to Lonnie and I. Our other children weren't like that. During Christmas time, we got some presents, she was playing with those, she was cruising, she was happy. I honestly, in my heart of hearts, thought we had a typical child 
that just needed a little bit help with feeding. At her 12 month appointment, her doctor suggested feeding therapy to us. But at that point, I really wanted to give her some more time. I, I wanted to see if she would start eating on her own instead of automatically assuming that she needed to be thrust into therapy. And also I knew we had the move coming up. So I was like, mm, let's just wait. It made sense at the time. Around 12 months old is when her stem, her hand stem kind of advanced to something a little bit more intense where she would either have something in her hand or not and she would stem her wrist and hand back and forth but at the same time she would like freeze up and tighten up her her, her face muscles and she was doing this periodically throughout the day Lonnie noticed it too Lonnie was also concerned it almost looked like her body was shaking a little bit I didn't think it was a seizure but I did wonder if something neuro might have been going on we did notice that she wasn't responding to her name or really progressing in development but I think when you want something so bad or don't want it you can't really see what is right in front of you. The next few months happen so fast, <laughs> so quickly. It's just a blur, February to April. If you don't know our story, in February, we were getting ready for our trip to Colorado in March. We lived in Florida at the time. Our trip was right in the middle of the coronavirus. And then when we came home, we had to pack up our entire house in two weeks. And then we ended up moving to Colorado. I genuinely thought we were moving across the country for the boys that needed services. I was relieved that obviously we would be able to help Danielle with her EOE more. I was also relieved we could get Penelope into the feeding clinic here. In no way or no shape did I think that that we were moving to further Penelope's development or something else was going on. I hadn't looked at a milestone chart in months. I had not researched the red flags for autism and toddlers in almost a year. By the time we moved to Colorado, Penelope was almost exactly 15 months old. She was still solely on formula, refusing any type of solid foods. She still wasn't responding to her name. She wasn't follow pointing, pointing, uh, bringing us things. And she was starting to stem more frequently throughout the day in different ways, not just that one specific stem. All the signs were there, but I just couldn't see them. Or maybe I could see them. Maybe deep down somewhere I knew it was there and I was just wearing my denial crown really, really, really well. Um, when I started the process to get the boys services here, I also started the process for Penelope as well. I made her 15 month appointment with the new pediatrician's office. And then when I called early intervention to get Liam moved over here, I also let them know that I had a 15 month old that also needed to be evaluated for early intervention. I didn't make that evaluation because I thought that she was developmentally behind. I made that evaluation because I wanted her to get as much help with feeding as possible. I know what happens if you wait too long to help a child that's struggling with feeding. I really wasn't nervous about it until we did the pre-assessment and they were asking me questions that I didn't even know she was supposed to do yet. Questions that she wasn't even close to doing. The night before her 15 month appointment, I decided to brave it and I pulled out the ASQ screening tool that I knew that they were gonna use the next day. If you don't know what ASQ is, it's basically a developmental screening tool just to see if they're behind on development. It doesn't necessarily mean autism. It's, it's just about like where they're at in development. As I was reading, the screening tool and I was going through each category and I couldn't even check off one item. I felt sick to my stomach. Out of 30 questions, she could only do one, which was climb on a small like surface. And I remember thinking, we have a problem. <sighs> now, Development is very, very wide. It's why when you Google when a child should start crawling, it says six to like 11 months and it's it's like this big range. So going into these screening tools, I, I knew that. I knew that she wouldn't be able to do every single one. No child can do every single one unless they're extremely advanced or something like that. And in that case, you're probably not looking at the ASQ, but she should have got more than one out of 30. And I knew that. I wanted to live in denial. I really did. I, I didn't want her to have an evaluation. I didn't want to do anything. I just, I just wanted to literally hide my head in the sand and pretend that this wasn't happening. The next day I took her to her appointment. I knew going in I needed an evaluation for the feeding clinic and also for speech because I wanted to get her a thorough evaluation just to make sure nothing like 
physical was going on, um, let them evaluate that. But then I wanted her to receive the services through speech. They could work on feeding and then as she got older, they could work on speech because she didn't have any words. I also showed the doctor a video of her, her um, stem. I didn't know it was a stem at the time, but of her stemming in the high chair. And that's when the doctor was like, oh yeah, that definitely looks like a classic stem that does not look neuro at all, which was a relief. She, of course, you know, went over the ASQ with me. She asked a bunch of questions, uh, tried to get Penelope to do things, saw Penelope's reactions to different things. And she looked at me and said, you know, she needs an autism evaluation, right? And I just broke down. I think everything just happened so fast. The next day, or at least I think it's the next day, I might have some of these timelines all, all mixed up, but the next day was her early intervention evaluation. If you don't know what happens during an early intervention evaluation, they basically screen your child's overall development and then they score them and then they kind of give you age equivalent. Now the age equivalent doesn't mean your child is actually like equivalent to a baby like that because it's very varied. For Penelope she was 15 months old at the time and she scored uh, four months, six months, two categories was eight months, gross motor skills was 11 months because she was almost walking so she was doing a lot better in the gross motor skill area. They did ask if I had a autism evaluation scheduled. They also informed me that they were placing her with one of their autism specialists and their autism team. I kind of knew where they were going with that. I could kind of read between the lines. That was a real hard day. The diagnosis isn't as scary as getting the news that your child is so behind. That next week I got a call from the children's hospital to kind of get the ball rolling on the autism evaluation. At that point I was told it's like a six to 12 month wait. So I was kind of comfortable with that. I was like, okay, like let's, let's give myself some time to process everything that's literally been thrown at me in two weeks time. Like let's process that. However, the children's hospital had different plans for me apparently, because when we did the pre assessment. And it's just, just basically an assessment to make sure that you really do need an autism evaluation as sometimes parents might think, oh, this is going on and this warrants an autism evaluation and they might feel like probably doesn't or maybe it needs a different type of specialist or things like that. So they did the pre-assessment and she asked a bunch of questions. It was about an hour long. I guess for my answers and the fact that we have a couple of kids on the spectrum in our family, she had decided to expedite the evaluation. And in my mind, expedite, I thought instead of six to 12 months, it'd be three to six months. I was like, okay, cool. And I just kind of waited to hear back from her. From that point forward, um, we had speech and OT evals for Penelope. Both therapists expressed concerns about her development. Um, both of them asked if we had an autism evaluation scheduled. During the occupational therapy evaluation, that is when we noticed another stem with Penelope, which was rocking, but the OT was also concerned about the fact that she stemmed in front of her eyes so much. So she wanted to make sure that her vision was okay. So that kind of put us on a, a path of maybe she has vision issues instead. While I didn't want my kid to have like vision issues, like no one really wants that. Glasses compared to, to a developmental disability, I would have definitely chosen the glasses because we knew that it wasn't like she couldn't see at all. She could obviously see, but we were like, maybe she can't see well. Um, well, a few days later, I took her to the doctor to have her vision screened and it was all okay. So at that point, we were kind of back on the autism train. Right after the OT evaluation ended, I actually got a call from the Children's Hospital at Developmental Pete's. That is when they told me that they had a cancellation and they could fit me in for the next Friday, a week from then. I just burst out into tears after I got off the phone. I think out of fear, but also out of relief. I mean, at this point, it's, it's pretty clear what's going on. It's pretty clear what direction we're heading into. I had time to Google autism signs in toddlers and Penelope had every single one of them. And I was also really glad that it was just gonna be over. The hardest part is being in limbo. The week of her autism evaluation, so that following week was not just her autism evaluation, but it was also her feeding evaluation. The feeding eval came first. It was three hours. It was with a doctor, a occupational therapist, a speech therapist, and a dietitian. They told me that they felt like it was sensory processing disorder, but the next question was, was an autism diagnosis appropriate. But then she said, hey, looks like you have your evaluation in the morning, so we don't even need to go there. So we're just gonna wait to see what they say. The next morning was her autism evaluation. 
It was a four hour evaluation. There was two doctors. Both of them were observing Penelope. Of course, they were observing her like how she was playing, but how she was interacting with me as well. But one of them was more primarily asking me, me questions while the other one was observing Penelope. I did find out later that they also used the feeding evaluation the day before in their decision, um, just because obviously it was another doctor and another set of professionals that were able to see Penelope for a long period of time. So in deciding her diagnosis, it was altogether three doctors and two therapists, essentially. At the end of the evaluation, Penelope was given a level three autism diagnosis. She scored below one percentile in her violent across the board, like below one percentile in literally everything and then below one percentile overall, of course. There were a lot of reasons that kind of led her to make that choice and I will talk to you guys about that if you if you kind of want to know more about what specific things she displayed that made them think this or anything like that i am actually going to be doing a two hour live stream tonight and tomorrow night on you now because today's the story tomorrow is her signs of autism so it's going to give everyone a chance to come over and ask questions if they want to ask questions i'm not going to do it on youtube at the same time just because it would be very overwhelming for me if you want me to go into more detail on stream i can definitely do that but i feel like this video is already going to be so 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 long basically penelope does have some strengths she definitely has things that are good going for her but then she has a lot of weaknesses and those weaknesses need the most support. After the diagnosis, they were very gentle and amazing, constantly wanted to make sure I was okay and they would stop and explain things and they were so thorough. They set me up an appointment for the social worker. So if you've seen those vlogs, that's why I had that appointment was to go over all of the services Penelope qualifies for and everything that would be beneficial to her in going forward. They also set Penelope and Liam up with a developmental pediatrician. If they get sick or something like that, I of course would take them to their primary physician but if it's something that has to do with anything about autism so sleeping issues eating issues like anything extra they are who i would go to they have ran many medical tests on her they ran a lot of blood tests um obviously the genetic test that hasn't come back yet but all the medical tests that have come back yet have come back normal we are going to be getting her hearing test hopefully very very shortly we don't think it's a hearing issue but of course it's always important to rule out when you have an autism diagnosis or you're suspecting autism. I know many of you guys are going to be kind of wondering like what her signs are and everything as again tomorrow I am doing her signs video where I will kind of go a little bit more deeper into the different signs that we saw, the doctor saw, the therapist saw, um, just kind of things that specifically worked for Penelope. It's not going to be in this video because again long. But let's go ahead and bring Lonnie in here and we're going to ask him some some frequently asked questions from his point of view, as this is, of course, my point of view. Like, I went through a lot of the appointments and things like that, but, I mean, he is still her dad, and he still has feelings. I think he has an interesting kind of take on this, and some of these questions I've never asked him, so I'm kind of curious what his what his answer is going to be. So we have Lonnie. I kind of thought of these questions, what I think that you guys would like to hear. So if you have any other questions for Lonnie, leave them in the comments below. But when did you start noticing that something wasn't typical about Penelope? I think I started noticing something along the lines of three months. When? Why? Just how she would react and how she would uh, respond to certain cues. Guys, I was living it's in denial. Like a, it's kind of like a gut feeling that you have. Yeah, well, the, well, that's how I felt about Liam. Like, Liam, I noticed really, really early. I mean, I was surprised when you got the diagnosis, but, like, not surprised at the same time. How did you feel when you realized that, like, she probably was going to end up being a special needs child? So here's an insert I wrote to my Facebook family and friends and just kind of give you an idea of where my mindset was at that time and place during that uh, moment. So I put on here... I've been focusing most of my energy on being the supportive husband today. Our baby girl's evaluation was yesterday, and although I've known all along that there was a huge possibility of autism, there is no sorrow in my heart, only relief that we know where to go from here 
and how. Many friends have asked, how are you feeling? I have shared my thoughts with this reply. Life is what you make it. No one has to live by the perfect cookie cutter code that your child has to be an all-American football player or perhaps be the next prom queen to have a successful and loving life. If it happens, it will happen. As long as they are happy and you do whatever it takes for your child, that's all that matters. You see, I never worry about the challenges my children face. It's overcoming challenges that makes them stronger and more adaptable to hardships. I'm not worried because my child's well-being and upbringing is based on how much involved I am in their lives. We are accustomed to focusing on the small things when it comes to negative things in life. I also, too, focus on the small things myself. But the things I focus on the most we sometimes overlook. We sometimes take for granted. Like, for example, holding my daughter in my arms as she looks me in the eyes and smiles while I sing to her. That look in her eyes knowing she's so content and so loved. The small things are important. It's just what small things we focus on that matters the most and what makes us whole. If you're going to focus on the small things, make sure it's worth the time. So now I'm gonna go over frequently asked questions, things that have been asked by like family or friends or when I opened up about this in live stream. Before we get into that, I am going to talk about probably the most common question. This isn't addressing hate or criticism. This isn't for people who say, oh, you just want your kids to have autism. If they can't watch our videos, if they can't see how hard this has been for me, if they can't understand that this wasn't something that was made willy-nilly <laughs> altogether, this was four doctors and seven therapists all having the same concerns, all having the same worries. My four-year-old, I'm getting him reevaluated. If I, I wanted all my kids to have autism, I would just have him keep the label. However, we do get some questions a lot of times like, why or how do you have so many kids on the spectrum? Like, why are they all special needs? I don't think every person that asks that question has ill intentions. I think it might be kind of confusing to come to my channel and not really know the background and things like that. Basically, it's like this. My 12 year old was our first special needs child. We have two older kids, Danielle and Lonnie. They're both typical. Noah came along and we realized early on that something was going on. The neurologist sent him for a genetic test. So at that point, we found out that he had had a genetic abnormality on chromosome 15. Fast forward seven years later, Lonnie and I really wanted to have more kids. Noah was stable at that point. Things were going great. So we went to the geneticist and asked her. She told us that since our older kids were typical and since no one else in our family was diagnosed with any kind of special needs or anything like that, then more than likely it's just a fluke. A genetic disorder does not mean it's hereditary. So with that news, Lonnie and I decided to have more kids and insert Lex. Lex was pretty typical. Like there wasn't anything I was worried about. He met all of his developmental milestones. He was crawling by seven months. He was waving at 11 months, bringing me things, reading books. Like he seemed like he was doing really, really well. And then I got pregnant with Liam when Lex was about 18 months old, I wanna say. Around 19, 20 months, I took Lex to his 18 month appointment a little bit late and that's when they expressed concern that he wasn't talking yet and they were also concerned about his expressive and receptive language. So they told me that he had some red flags for autism. Lex did have a few sensory issues. There were things that we were concerned about, but not overly. However, at that point it was kind of a non-issue because I was already pregnant with Liam. When Liam was born, we went and got Liam's um, a, a genetic test done and we found out that he had the same abnormality. So then they also tested Alexander and Alexander had the same ab abnormality as well. We did not plan to have any more children at that point because Liam was already showing some delays very, very early on. I was on birth control. Lonnie was planning to get a vasectomy soon. And voila, I was pregnant with Penelope. Lex was diagnosed with autism last year at the age of three and a half, but he's gonna be reevaluated next month because the doctor wasn't sure either. She kind of went back and forth. The next question is, is it Penelope too young to be diagnosed? So in some areas, especially outside of America, you have to be quite a bit older to be diagnosed. Like I've heard all the way up to like age six is a requirement. A lot of hospitals 
will not diagnose until the age of two. Like they, they at least have to be two years old. Two hospitals that I've come into contact with that start evaluations at 14 months um, is the Boston Children's Hospital and the Children's Hospital in Colorado. Both are renowned hospitals nationwide, um, worldwide even. They honestly are up on, on top of their stuff, guys, <laughs> like way on top of their stuff. And if you do look into to the research, it does show that a child can be diagnosed accurately. I think the, the, the rate is like 65% at the age of 14 months and then like 83% accuracy at 16 months. So there is definitely some accuracy there, especially if you have a child that is meeting all the signs, they are completely positive. There was no doubts at all. Um, they said if they ever have any doubts, like even the smallest amount of doubts, they'll have the child come back in like six months or a year or something like that. And that is not the case. I kind of talked about this because Liam got diagnosed at age 18 months. So Liam was a couple weeks older than Penelope was when she got diagnosed. The other like question or comment we get is, could they grow out of their behaviors? I saw this a lot with Liam. Some of these things I'm just using from my memory from when I talked about Liam's diagnosis. If it was just one or two things, like let's say that it was just that she was behind on speech maybe, or she wasn't responding to her name or something like that, then yes, they could definitely grow out of that. They could start talking. But when you have a child that has so many traits across the board, the chances of them growing out of everything is, is very low. And if a child is diagnosed on the spectrum and then they grow out of their behaviors, like truly, they're, they're truly no longer considered autistic. They weren't autistic to begin with. That's not to say a child can't improve. I think that's kind of the difference. Sometimes individuals and children can show autistic traits, maybe enough to get a diagnosis, but then with time it, it, it changes. That doesn't mean that they've suddenly grown out of their autism. The next one is something that Lonnie and I thought ourselves and that is could she be copying Liam's behaviors and this was definitely something that I kind of hoped obviously her copying his behaviors versus her actually having autism would be ideal. There are some behaviors that she could have just been copying like when she started doing the head shaking stem and the hand flapping I didn't think anything of it because I thought the same thing like she could just be copying Liam. Um, her not being able to play appropriately she could just be copying Liam. But her fixation, um, the receptive expressive language, the communication barriers, the social barriers, the other stimming that she has, those aren't things that she could be copying. She has a lot of stems. We'll talk about it tomorrow, but too many to say, oh yeah, she's just copying her brother. The other question is, will I get the waiver for her as well? The waiver comes with a set of like resources beyond what insurance will provide usually. Penelope would not qualify because the things that she needs right now are completely normal. Any other 17 month old needs them. All the waivers do is just give her extra coverage on insurance basically. They'll they'll just cover more things for her. The waiver wouldn't provide any things that she needs so she wouldn't qualify. She doesn't need anything from it so at this point of time waivers aren't really appropriate for her. If it becomes appropriate for her in the future then we would apply for it. The other question is what therapies is she in? What therapies are she going to be in? Am I going to put her in ABA? All of these are big 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 questions. Um, currently she's in occupational therapy and speech therapy. Both of those are twice a week. And then she's also in early intervention as well with the autism team. And she will be in that twice a week once they get in home and not telehealth anymore. Right now it's just once a week. As far as ABA, we are putting her into an EDSM. It's early Denver starter model, I think. <laughs> and it's basically ABA based, but it's more catered towards younger children, like young toddlers. So it can help them without being so stressful because if you guys remember I tried putting Liam in ABA at a very young age like 19 months and it just wasn't working for him. Its main focus is to help find her motivators because if you can't find what motivates your child it's going to be hard to to help them like engage and teach them things. She will eventually go into ABA because she's we are trying to get her into this local kind of local private 
autism school. I've kind of talked about it, but I didn't go into detail. So it is an autism school that I'm hoping her and Liam can go into. And it's a pre-K, it has a pre-K program for early intervention from the age two and a half till their seventh birthday. And it's ABA based, so insurance will pay for it. It's an amazing school and it has amazing reviews. So I'm really excited about it. They also have a K through 12 program. They have camps. They have a lot of things. If you follow Fathering Autism and you know that the JSA that Abby goes to that's kind of similar to what this school would be. Um, it is a little bit of a drive for us, but I'll make the drive. I'll go more into detail about the school once it gets closer. At this point, Penelope's not even two, so I don't have to worry about it, but we're, we're just trying to make sure that we are giving all of our kids their best chance. Another question is when I notice signs of autism. <laughs> 15 months, no. Looking back, it was probably around 13 months that things started to, to emerge where if I had been paying attention, if I hadn't been so busy, I probably would have started noticing it. But I think I probably did notice things, but I knew at 13 months was too young to really do anything. So there's no reason to sit there and borrow worry. Sometimes you, you just have to wait for your child to get older. You just have to support them as much as you possibly can. The other question is the levels, like what level three means. A lot of people are gonna look at it as like level one's mild, level two's moderate, and level three is severe. But what the levels really mean, because you really can't like measure autism. Them, right you you can't get out of the measuring cup and fill it up with autism and be like oh looks like it's 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 just mild <laughs> no it, it doesn't work like that I, I think <laughs> everyone has the same amount of autism I think it just affects them in different ways so the levels are actually the level of support they need so level one is need support level two is need substantial support and level three needs needs very substantial or the most substantial support. And the other question is, can levels change? And they absolutely can. Um, as she gets therapies and gets help, um, it, it, it could change to where she doesn't need as much support. I mean, that's the goal. That's why early intervention is there. And that's what our hope is. I think Noah is a perfect example. Um, I think Noah probably would have got a level two if levels were a thing back then. He probably would have got a level two and now he's a level one to two. So he's definitely improved. The other one is comparing Penelope and Liam. Liam was diagnosed with moderate to severe. Um, I did ask the doctor that evaluated him if she could like tag a level on him what it would be and she said she would say level two. If, if she had to. So Liam is considered level two, Penelope's considered level three. After reading her violin report, I understand. There was a lot that Liam could do at his evaluation that Penelope could not. Liam responded to his name a little bit of the time. She had to call his name, I think like five times. I called his name twice before he, before he turned around. It didn't matter how many times we called Penelope's name. During Liam's evaluation, he came to check in with me once. Um, Penelope never came the entire three and a half hours. She never came to check in with me to see what I was doing. Her stimming's definitely more intense than Liam's was. I can kind of see the difference on why she got level three and he's level two. Uh, but the differences and similarities between Liam and Nellie as far as like autistic traits. Penelope, Penelope is more present than Liam. Liam is still just that kid that is off in his own world. It's hard to get him to engage. Penelope, it's, 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 a bit easier like you you can kind of get her to focus if if you if you really work for it she just stim more than liam though and that's that's a difference liam has a head shaking stem and he flaps his hands and he jumps and things but it's it's not like prominent penelope stimming is very very prominent and it was one of the first things that was noticed by all of the therapists that evaluated nelly seems to be more of a sensory avoider Liam loves sensory things so much. Liam's a great eater. Nellie is not. So those are just kind of the basics. I mean, I can kind of break it down if you want to ask me in stream. I'll kind of break it down more for you. But those are the more just basic things when I think about them off the top of my head, what the differences between them are. Another question is because the feeding clinic said she had sensory processing disorder and then developmental Pete says she has autism. Does she have SPD and autism or does she just have autism? On her diagnosis, she just has autism because sensory kind of goes under the under the autism umbrella. The last question that's kind of been asked is kind of like, how is the family handling this? Like this is for sure number three diagnosed with autism, possibly number four. Like how are we all coping? Um, I think we can say by how many times I 
almost broke down in this video that I'm not coping the best, but I feel like I'm coping better because I'm able to make this video. By the time that vi this video goes up, um, I had the news for two, three weeks, I think, I, I wanna say. Lonnie handled it the best. The kids were all just kind of disappointed and sad. I mean, obviously we, we all love Penelope. She is, she's a favorite here, okay? And so we are all just sad that we're gonna have to see her struggle. We're sad that she's gonna have to go through so many therapies, but at the same time, we are so thankful. And that's what I wanna end this video on, is out of everything, out of no matter how hard this has been, if we would have been in Florida when I got this news, I would be just breaking down, guys, because it didn't doesn't matter if we live in Florida or Colorado. She had autism no matter what, but at least being thrown a loop with all these things, at least we're able to get her the help she needs, the help the boys need, and we're in a place that she can live her best life. I'm just so grateful for that. So thank you. I've said this before, but without you guys, we wouldn't have been able to make this move. So I appreciate you. I love you. Please be kind in the comments. <laughs> we will be going live tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on You Now. Um, it'll be a two hour stream. You Now, if you don't know what it is, it's a live streaming app. It's free to sign up. It's not a gimmick. It is literally free. You can go to younow.com forward slash our landing crew, or you can download the app on your tablet or phone. Um, it's just interactive. I don't enjoy going on YouTube as much. Just one, the stream messes up a lot. It's just not as interactive as this app. This app is amazing. Um, everyone in usually enjoys it. Like 95% of people who come over this app stay because of how much they love it. You get a free spin every 24 hours, you get free bars, and we just have a good, good time. I feel like we're all a community. So if you want to come over and chat and ask questions, that's definitely a great time to do it. That's it guys. I did it. See you tomorrow. Where you move, make me blind. You will always be there. There's no doubt in my mind. You will always be